Thanks, Damien, and I um, hope I won't blow this mic out here. Uh, welcome again. This is wonderful to be here. And we do this, we've done this around the country, and it's really a wonderful event because everyone comes to give you, just give you knowledge about what's available and what you can do for your kids in, um, in, in the system. I'm going to set my little timer here so I don't go over. There we go. Now, you should have received one of these strange papers in your. You probably thought, what this? What is this thing? If you don't have one, Vanna here, my assistant Vanna will give, will give you one. Okay, so I'm going to try to loosen you up a little bit for these guys. And uh, so you're probably going to wonder what these pictures are. And I have Asperger's syndrome, so I think visually. So I, this is my whole speech right there. So um, what is that first little object there? That's a gear shift, right, for a car. So, it happens to, always are related to a story. So we had a student in Berkeley at our center there who was having difficulty changing. He's very rigid, Aspie. And, uh, and during his meeting, he said uh, something about SH happens. And I said, no, Sam, shift happens. And in your exhibiting it by your changes that you're making in the program, so I ended up getting him a t-shirt that, sh that shift happens on it. And all the students wanted them, so we started making t-shirts that said shift happens on them. And, uh, and I really liked it. So that's, that's sort of a little bit of beginning. Who can guess what the second picture is about? Okay. Well, that's, uh, it's a clearinghouse and a headhunter. And that's what parents and professionals need to be for their students during transition because you have to be a clearinghouse for knowledge and information and finding the right services for them like that's why you're here a lot of you right and then you have to be a headhunter find that right teacher that right social mentor that right clinical staff that's going to mentor and help your student the best and so that's your job and 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 professionals too we get referrals from psychologists psychiatrists you know school social workers etc so you're looking for the best situation for your son or daughter, and that's your job. What is the next picture? Anyone have a guess? No, I guess not. It's too oblique, probably. Yeah, there. What? It looks to me like uh, the happy face at the top, sort of like the, I can't tell what the middle one is. I think it looks like a... Uh, it's happy, neutral, sort of neutral, and sad maybe, right? Yep. So it sort of doesn't really fit the analogy exactly, but it's a, I call it the law of regression of diminishing returns. And that's a big Aspie way for saying what happens is parents are very effective in junior high and maybe high school, but after that, parents actually cause more problems many times for their student than they actually help them because it's the law of diminishing returns. What worked in junior high and high school, your intervention, your micromanaging and everything, doesn't work when they get to, to uh, after 18 because they have to learn to stand on their own two feet. So if you try to wake them up in their dorm at USC every morning to get them to classes, it's not going to work. So you're going to have to adopt strategies earlier to deal with that before they get to that age. And so what's the next picture? Looks like some crazy woman with a chainsaw and a baby. What is it? It's called, we call it the steel umbilical card. Cutting that steel and vocal cord that exists between parents. I was talking to the mom over here, one of our students, and I said, how are you feeling? How are you coping with him being gone? So it's really tough. And I said, well, you, you know, it's time to get a life, right? I mean, you got to date your husband again and start living and maybe take up some, you know, schooling or some clubs or travel because the more that you let go, the better they're going to be uh, in that situation. So parents... Uh, can accidentally they have a symbiotic relationship with their kid and they just sort of feel all their, all their pain and everything even more so than your first kid that goes off to college or your last kid a kid with learning differences has a special place you know you're more protective it's like that's what the species does right you protect your little cubs and if you have a cub that's having a little trouble you're going to keep it right near you so it's hard to let go but the student will not form relationships or peers at college or in a program if you're still dating them by the phone or the internet. And I, and I mean dating them. 
you know, you got to let go and let them start standing on their feet. It's a hard thing to do. And it's a lot harder than people think when they go to do it. So the next picture is these guys holding these bags. What does that symbolize? Anyone have a clear? It's what the parents say to us. Let them struggle. Let them learn to struggle with their money, with other things, so that when they get out of your program, you know, they don't suffer from affluenza. Did you notice someone used that as a defense in the, a kid? You know, that's ridiculous. But anyway, uh, so that's let them struggle. And then what's the next one? We're going to move right through. DM. Anyone got a clue? Default mode. What's the default mode of kids on the spectrum after they leave? When they, after they leave college or a program like ours, what's the default mode of people on the spectrum? Isolation, exactly. And so you can watch it. If we don't give them, I was telling the staff in our training, if, they don't, if we don't teach them to be self-change agents while they're with us, they go right back to it when their job, they don't socialize, they, they stop there. The weird person in the apartment building with the Game Boy who lives on 2B that no one knows and they go right back in the box. And so we got to teach them to stay out of the box by change as their ally and how to seek change and try new things. The next one, what is that about? That's self-care, exactly. Support yourself. Healthy mother, healthy child. Calm dad, calm child. This is how it works. So you have to mentor what you want your child to have. If you're anxiety, if you're, if you're an emotional mess because your kid is going to go away, then what do you think is going to happen with the kid? Okay? So you have to mentor it. You have to take care of yourself. You can't give anything to anyone else that you don't have yourself. Right? So if you're not calm and you're not structured, chances are they're not going to be either. The next one is not the World Trade Centers. What is it? It's a bar graph, and it means... The more that you let go, the better they do. It's almost, it goes right up. It's almost like an equal bar graph. But you have to let go. You have to, don't just let go and say, okay, you're on your own. You know, or tough love. You have to let, hand it off in the right way. And we're one of the handoffs. There are a lot of handoffs. USC has handoffs in their department. So you, you, you find the right handoff and you build that support around them and you've got to let go and let them try to do it themselves. Otherwise, they're on your couch when they're 35. And that's not a good thing. Oops. Okay, so that's the bar graph. The next one is a little soda can. What does that mean? Anyone know that, that acronym? Stop, observe, deliberate, and take action. So when a student calls and asks for a solution or to be rescued, we teach them to start doing this themselves. And, you know, the advisors work with them. So you stop, deliberate, uh, I mean, you know, observe what's going on, deliberate, and then take action. And the other thing you can do when you get to the delete, the D in soda, is you can use the donkey rule. And every staff and every student at CIP has to know it because they're going to remember it the rest of their life, and it helps them because social thinking is not my forte. So... Um, See, I'm doing pretty good with time so far. I'm more than halfway through. Good. So the donkey rule is if five people call it a donkey, people you trust that are mentors for you call it a donkey and you're still calling it a horse, then don't be a jackass and do what they say <laughs> because their, their cumulative intelligence is stronger than yours. So this is how I went from one program with 10 students 12 years ago after I was diagnosed to six programs with 150 <coughs> students around the country because my social skills were so lacking, I couldn't work as part of a team, I couldn't look at you, I couldn't have reciprocal conversation, I was very rigid, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So once I started to learn what I could do about those things, my confidence level went up and I said, sure, I can open these programs, I can do this, and I just went and did it. You know, most of them in like three or four years. So um, the next one, What's that stand for? Someone take a guess at that. When will we get there? And that is parents think, and a lot of times, that they're gonna, their kid is going to be 23, and all of a sudden he'll be all right. It takes much longer because these kids are six years probably emotionally 
behind their peer group usually. So if they're 19, they're like 13 maybe in some ways. Very mature in other ways, students. <laughs> but, but maybe lack behind a little bit in other areas. So like me, I was 35 and I, was, I act like I was 15, you know, in some ways in my life. But super responsible in other areas, but very immature in other areas. And my kids are more mature than I am still. All of them are socially more mature than I am which doesn't make any sense to me, but that's what happened. So the next one is, that's the door of willingness. And so we have to, students have to be workable. So they have to be willing to, to try new things and to come to a program like ours or, or go to services like at USC, you're not gonna drag them out of the dorms to come to the Learning Disability Center. They have to be willing to go there for the help. And if they go there, they'll probably be successful. If they're smart enough to get in here, they're probably smart enough to pass if they get the help they need. So they have to have the willingness, and that's a big thing. So we have to teach them to be willing to try new things and to encourage them. Um, it's critical that they have cognitive flexibility somehow in their lives. Okay. And let's go. We're on to the PCP stands for Person Center Planning. That's what we're trying to teach our students. We try to have them plan three months, yearly, five-year goals in every area, social, sensory, executive functioning, career, life skills, academic, and they set goals. And, they, and our students do PowerPoints <laughs> with pictures, music, and everything on it. Pictures of their internship they had or their family members that are important to them, their music, and they put their goals right on there and they show it to their parents and say, this is what I want for my life. And sometimes it doesn't match up what the parents think it's going to be. Um, the next one is uh, a tulip garden and that stands for the fact that we need to understand that development precedes, you know, cephalocaudal, proximal, distal, top, bottom, inside out, and at different levels for different people. Like I'm very emotional, I'm very high functioning at, at a young age in some areas and socially still below my children who are in their 20s and 30s. So that's just going to probably always be a little imbalance in my life. But so in May, some of the flowers will probably be June for us now back east because we have ice, you know, and snow coming this week again. But whatever. Anyway, so the, the tulips, some of them bloom in early May. A whole lot of them bloom in the middle of May, and some of them bloom at the end of May. And the ones that bloom at the end of May are just as beautiful as the ones that bloom in the beginning of May or in the middle of May. They just bloom later. So late bloomers are usually people like my, our students, myself. But we, if we get it, we get it really well, and we take off, but maybe a lot longer, you know. So parents, you're looking at 26, 28, 30, when they settle in, probably. And that's just reality for most of them. And then the next one is thank you for coming and think positive. And I have actually been done two minutes early, so you know. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thanks.